Hello, everyone. How are you? Second to last session of the day. Who's, uh, who's looking forward to sleep? Uh, I know I am. Who went out way too long last night? Just, just me then. Okay, good. I'm, I'm in good company. I'm in a small good company. Um, thanks for joining me for this session. Uh, basically, I want to um, chat with you about extensibility within Auth0. So for those of you, I think I recognize most of your faces, so thanks for coming by the booth. Um, for those of you who don't know, Auth0 is an identity as a service provider, and basically we provide a whole lot of SDKs that you can wrap around your application uh, to create a login mechanism that we will keep safe and secure and has a whole lot of features behind it um, on your behalf. So I'm not gonna go into a sales pitch on why you should use it. I want to show you how extensibility can work, and it's based on a three-hour workshop so if you have your laptops out and you've done your um, prep prep preparation, um, we will get stuck, no? Okay, this is a shorter version of that, so I'm gonna basically cover a small part of that workshop. Workshop is, um, it's all on GitHub, so if you wanna do it in your own time, I think there's a link on the last slide, I'll definitely make sure you have it if you want to. Um, so it can be done self-guided, it is one that I give in person as well. Um, but I wanna show you that just the Auth0 part of, um, of the workshop to show you that um, while you are essentially outsourcing identity to a third party, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can do to customize the way that Auth0 works on your behalf during that process. Um, so the idea of the workshop, I always forget about the slide about me. I don't like talking about myself very much, but uh, the main thing to take away from here is I'm actually, I've been a software engineer now for over 22 years, um, and I love speaking to the community, so that's why you see me up here today. Um, again, thanks for coming. Uh, there was also a, a Twitter handle down there, so my DMs are open if you want to contact me. That's, that's one way of, of doing that. Um, but what I want to do today is, we're not actually going to build this, but if you were in the workshop with me, what we would be building today is basically a, a web store. Um, I want to have dynamic product catalogs, so I don't want to have to redeploy every time I have a new product. I want user authentication, so that I know who's making an order for which product. And I want to have checkout and payment, so that I can get money from people who are buying my awesome products. Um, one thing I want to do, though, is I want to think slightly outside of the box. So the technologies that we're going to be using are Auth0 for the identity, Netlify for hosting, and one of the things I like about Netlify, main reason I use it for this demo, is um, when, you, when you install the local Netlify um, binary, essentially, you can do Netlify dev instead of NPM dev, and for those of you who are not uh, JavaScript developers, you don't need to understand JavaScript to get through today's um, session. In fact, the workshop will probably be quite easy to follow as well. Um, but one of the things I like about Netlify Dev is it actually allows you to run uh, cloud functions locally in your development environment. So you don't have to deploy your cloud functions in order to get your application working, which is really powerful. Uh, we're gonna be using Stripe for payments, and we're gonna be building the application in React. So it's gonna be totally single page app running in the browser. Um, what's one thing that if you were architecting a web application like this that was a web store, what's the one thing that's missing? Hey? Authentication, Authentication that's all zero. We do that quite well. <laughs> Database. Where are we gonna store the orders? Where are we gonna store the products? Where are we gonna store information about my users? Obviously, Auth0 will provide information about the user from an identity perspective, but if you're writing a web application, say we were doing a banking application, when you're modeling your data out, you're gonna have bank accounts and transactions and all of these things, but you're gonna have a user that all of those tie to, so you would still have a user model in your database, but we don't have a database. We're gonna el eliminate a custom database altogether, and we're gonna be able to do that because of the extensibility um, tools that we have within Auth0. So how's this gonna work? Um, I've already mentioned why I like, like Netlify. It's got the CLI tools, allows you to run a local dev server, and allows you to run those functions that would normally be hosted by Netlify, run them locally so you can actually test your application with those functions existing. Uh, and the way that this process would work at the, at the point that, um, at, as, as we're rendering the application, is we want to get a list of products, and those products are gonna be defined in Stripe. Stripe actually allows you to define products and pricing and images and descriptions and that kind of thing. So there's no point in storing that in another database. We've got an authoritative source of that already. So our, our function here can make a call to Stripe to get that information back. And the reason we're using a, a cloud function here is because React is all in the browser and Stripe is gonna need some kind of secret key, API key for communication. We can't put that in the browser. We want to try and keep everything in the browser. So, our function is gonna be able to make a call to Stripe and say, give me a list of all the products, which is then going to return and we can render. But when it comes to buying a product, we need to know who's buying the product. 
because in order to start a Stripe checkout, you need to give it a Stripe customer ID. Otherwise, Stripe doesn't know who's making the purchase. We don't have that yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide a login mechanism with Auth0, and once a person has started the login process, we're going to make a call directly from Auth0 to Stripe. This is where Actions come in, and Actions is that extensibility platform. So you can run your, arbit your own arbitrary JavaScript in, in our environment. We've got node backends that will run that for you uh, during the process that somebody's logging in or creating an account or changing a password or various other things. And once Stripe has created that customer, it's going to return the customer ID, which we can store inside the user. Another thing I like about Auth0 is that against a user, you can actually store information. And we've got user metadata and app metadata. Has anybody used Auth0 and seen these before? So essentially, and this confused me quite a bit uh, when I first saw these. They, they allow you to store arbitrary JSON against each user. But I thought that it was information about the user and information about the app. But it's actually information that the user can change and information that the app can change. So that's why we're storing it in app metadata, because we don't want the user to be able to change their Stripe user ID and or custom ID. And the, the kind of place where a user metadata would be useful is like, do they want dark mode? Because if they manage to change that information themselves, it doesn't matter. It's just configuration setting, right? And just quickly, you might be wondering, like, how would the user do that anyway? Auth0 has got an API backend management API thing. Um, the, the user metadata can be updated just with the, um, the token that's generated when the user logs in, whereas the app metadata, you need to have uh, a, a secret for your application to talk to. So that's something you wouldn't do, again, in a React application. It would have to be done in a cloud function or something that's a secure environment. Um, so once we've got that, we can then provide the access token with the Stripe customer ID added into it. So that's another thing we're going to do. After we've generated the Stripe customer ID by making that request, in one action, we're going to create a second action that's going to pull that out again and is going to add it into the access token that then gets returned back to our React application. So the access token now has a custom claim inside it. Uh, so if you're not familiar with JSON Web Tokens, the payload is basically a set of claims, and a claim is like, I claim that this user's name is Ben. And by virtue of the signature matching, you can verify those claims haven't been modified in transit. That's why they're called claims, because they're assertions of the truth, and you can verify whether or not that's the case by checking the signature of the JSON Web Token. Once that happens, we can now pass that access token directly into the function that we've written, and the function can then pull out the Stripe customer ID and provide that to Stripe when uh, starting the checkout process. And the way the Stripe checkout processes work is they actually make a request to their API endpoint saying, I want to start a checkout process for Ben. Here's the product he wants to buy. And it'll then return a, a response which includes a URL which the user is re redirected to. Um, so that's pretty much it, so let's go. Uh, any questions about like the architecture of what we're trying to do here? Order management and payment gateway, uh, is it covered by Stripe as well? Uh, the, the, the which management? Automatic, yeah, that's all in Stripe. So Stripe's going to show, and we'll, we'll have a look at the Stripe dashboard as well. Um, so in fact, we'll do that right now. Let's jump across to here. So here's um, a running version of the application. This is like step seven or something in the workshop. Um, so obviously, we don't have three hours, and uh, I don't want to bore you by just typing lots of stuff and not talking, because I don't type and talk very well. As you can tell, I'm still not touching my laptop very much. Uh, but this is basically the, the, the view that I've got in my React application, and that information is coming directly from Stripe. And if we look in Stripe, we've got two products here. Uh, we've got some prices against them, and that's being pulled out from the Stripe API by our Netlify function, which is then being returned as JSON to our React application, which is then able to render that into what we see here. So now we've got that dynamic aspect. I can add a product into Stripe. It'll show up here on the next refresh. So what I've done also so far in terms of Auth0 integration is we have an application here. So the way that Auth0 works in this sense is that we've defined our React application as an application. And then on the left underneath, you'll see the APIs. Uh, our Netlify functions are defined as an API. And what that allows Auth0 to do is when a user logs in, you get the identity token, the JSON web token that contains information about the identity of the person who just logged in, and an access token, which is generally a JSON web token, especially in this case, because we're going to be talking to a specified API that we have. And in that JSON web token, in the payload, there's what's called um, an audience. And an audience is basically an array of domains um, or identifiers for APIs that are allowed to consume this access token. So by defining both of those in there, that's how Auth0 allows you to control 
um, which audiences each token gets so that you can kind of limit who consumes that token because we want to make sure the token isn't used by a system that you're not expecting it to use or expecting to use it. Lots of bits in that sentence. Um, so I've defined this web store already. Um, we've got the domain here, so this is basically my tenant. Every single application um, that wants to log in is gonna redirect to this URL, and uh, that's the login. You can choose whatever you want as a name in there as long as it's not taken. You can also have custom URLs. Uh, and we've got a client ID, and that's specific to this configuration here. So what this means is that when somebody clicks on login, we're gonna provide that client ID as part of the, the call to Auth0. And all of the configuration here can now be used in order for Auth0 to know what to present to your users when they're logging in. Um, and importantly, some of that includes the allowed callback URL, the allowed logout URL, and the allowed web origin. And I'll skirt over this. If you want to know more about it, catch me afterwards, because, or maybe we'll have time at the end for Q&A. But essentially what this is doing is telling Auth0 where it's allowed to transmit certain information so that we can't accidentally send information to a website that you don't control. So in this case, I'm only going to allow any kind of auth code. So if you came to my talk yesterday on, on auth flows, the auth code that gets sent back um, can only be sent back to localhost port 8888, which means that we can't get a man in the middle attack that's going to redirect that auth code to a, a different system. Uh, and we have a quick look at the code uh, in app, no, nope, index.js here. You'll see what I've done at the top there is I've pulled in the auth0 provider uh, so we've got NPM modules for that. We've got, if, if you're not in JavaScript world, if you're in Python world, we've got pip modules. If you're in .NET, we've got SDKs for that as well. But I've basically pulled in the React uh, module for Auth0. And then down here on line 12, 11, 12, we've got the Auth0 provider. Um, and again, you don't need to understand React hugely, but basically what this does, React is a component-based um, application, so each thing is its own component, and it used to be that you'd have to pass information down the chain into each of the components in order to know whether or not a user's logged in or how they can log in. This basically means that every component in your application can now uh, request information about the user. So that's all we really had to do to integrate React with Auth0. Um, there are some other things, oops, Try not to change the code. Do I change the code? No. Um, there are some other things that we've done as well, like uh, in the layout here. So this is how you get the information out. Um, is the application still loading? In which case we don't know whether the user's logged in or not yet, because it's a single page app. It's still booting up in the browser. Uh, are they authenticated? Which we can work out when is loading is false. And then we've got a link to a logout call. So you can see the logout button here says, if we're not loading anymore and the user is authenticated, show a logout button. Uh, otherwise, uh, the login button is actually um, in a different component, but I'm not gonna go too in-depth in, into that. Um, right, so if we jump back over to the application we have, you can see this is where I put the login button. So basically this says login when we don't know who the user is. As soon as we know who the user is, it's gonna say buy this product. So let's, uh, let's hope that I've set this up correctly. And if I click on the login button, I'm gonna to have to create an account because this is a new tenant that I've just created. So I'll come to sign up. And this is the part where I can't talk and type very well. So I'm creating an account for, it for the first time. Um, this is coming up because I'm running in localhost. So it, it shows you more consent information. If you were authenticating to a third party API, for example, you would get this as well. And you're probably familiar with that with when you do things like um, logging into uh, an application with Facebook. Facebook is gonna say, are you happy for me to share your information with this, um, this other, uh, other web application? Now that I'm logged in, you can see we've got the logout, the logout button at the top, and we've got the buy now buttons at the bottom. But at this point, the application doesn't have the Stripe customer ID. In fact, in fact, if we look in Stripe at the customers, there aren't any customers in Stripe either yet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate those two actions in order to create the Stripe customer, so we can get the Stripe customer ID back, and then to add that into the access token. So uh, I'm going to cheat because uh, typing and talking at the same time is uh, interesting, especially when you're actually coding. Um, so I'm gonna jump over to GitHub, write your own web store, and we're gonna copy the code from the, um, connecting all the to Stripe, from the, um, the readme itself. So you can see here, you, it's broken down into steps to help you if you want to do this in your own time. And we're going to copy this code here All right, so if we come down to actions, 
We've got flows and library. So we've also got something called a marketplace. So a lot of other vendors, existing vendors, have put their own code in so that you can just drag and drop those into the authorization pipeline. Um, but we want to go to the library of um, actions that we have available to us, which at the moment is none. Um, and if we jump over to the custom tab, we can see we also don't have any custom ones. I'm going to build a custom action rather than using an existing one. And we'll call this create Stripe user. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are different hooks that you can post, plug this in at. You might argue that the best place to put this is when a user registers. And normally I would agree with you, because you want to create it only the first time a user registers. You don't need it to be done every time thereafter. However, in this particular situation, I already have a user account. So I would have to create a new one. And if you're in a situation where you're retrofitting something, then you might already have users. So in this case, I'm going to leave it on login. So every time somebody logs in, I'm going to make sure that they have a Stripe customer ID. And if not, we will then create a Stripe customer. Uh, these, these triggers are fixed, so because we have to like plug them in at, um, at the back end within the code, so when we hit an event, it'll trigger this code. Um, there's a, a likelihood that we're going to be adding more in the future. So actions came out for general availability about a year ago, uh, and these are the first six that came in. Uh, if you have any points that you, you think look, it would be really useful to have a hook here, let me know, and I can certainly pass that back to the product team. So we'll leave that as uh, login, uh, post login. And this is what the actions coding environment looks like. So we've actually tried to make it as much as possible like an IDE. Um, on the left-hand side here, we've got the ability to test before we even deploy any of this code into um, like operating in production, even though this is technically like a production tenant. It's not running yet when somebody logs in. Um, we've got secrets. So in the same way as you have a .n file, we, we're going to need to add a secret in here. Uh, we can add those secrets in that can then be used in your code. And the funnest part, I don't think funnest is a word, but it is now. Uh, funnest part is adding dependencies. So you can actually add pretty much any NPM module that you want. Uh, there are some exceptions. So anything that has static C bindings within the NPM module. And there's another restriction that isn't coming to me at the moment. Um, but it's basically a very small subset of all NPM modules that can't be used. Uh, but other than that, you've got access to the thousands and thousands of NPM modules that you might need. I think there's a limit to how many you can um, add as a dependency to your code. It might be like 10 or 15, because otherwise you're really slowing down the process, but you've got access to all of them. Um, so I'm going to add in the Stripe module. Uh, we'll come back to secrets in a bit. And in here, I'm going to paste, oops, let's actually select all of this text. I'm going to paste it first, and then we'll, we'll quickly walk through it and see what's going on under the hood. So is that big enough? I can't get feedback from the people at home. I can make it bigger, but then it starts getting harder to actually see it all. So let me know if you want it enlarged. Uh, but basically, we, we're pulling in Stripe at the top there as a, uh, we're basically instantiating it. First thing we're going to do is we're going to check in the app metadata. So remember how we looked at the app metadata and the user metadata? That's accessible from the event object that gets passed in to this function. So the event object contains a whole lot of things, information that you can consume in order to make decisions. And the API uh, object that gets sent in is, allows you to make um, changes or to affect some kind of change outcome from, from the process that you're going through. So in this case, we're going to take from the event the app metadata and we're going to say, do they have a Stripe customer ID already? If they do, we're just going to return because we don't need to do it again. Assuming now that we don't, we're going to call the Stripe customer create into it. We're going to pass the email address, which is basically email provided when I logged in. We're going to provide a description, which can be anything you want. I'm also going to pass in the user ID. So this is the auth0 user ID, so that Stripe can store that in its metadata. And the result from that is cust the customer object down at the bottom there. We're going to grab the ID. That's the Stripe customer ID that just got created. And we're going to set the app metadata for this user. So the next time this happens, obviously, line 12 is going to return, because this line down here has now set a, uh, a Stripe customer ID. But we can now ensure as long as there's no network communication errors or like stuff out of our control, uh, we can now ensure that we've got a Stripe customer created as soon as the person logs in. So if we hit deploy, this is basically going to deploy it available for introduction into the auth pipeline, but it's not going to run in production yet. If we now jump over to flows and choose the login flow, we can drag from the custom tab over here, here's the Stripe, uh, create Stripe user uh, custom action that I just created. And we can drag that into the, the pipeline. And then as soon as I hit apply, now at any point that anybody logs into the system, we're going to ensure that that user has a, a Stripe customer ID. Uh, the other thing we wanted to do was 
uh, let's come back over to the library, and we're going to create another custom one, is we need to add the Stripe customer ID, customer it, uh, to the access token. And the code for that is much simpler. So essentially, we're going to copy one of the lines we had from the previous script and say, is there a Stripe customer ID? Because there's, like I said, if there's a network outage or some kind of communication issue, we might not actually have one. So let's check that there is a Stripe customer ID first. And if there is, we're going to set a custom claim. I see in here the custom claim looks quite long and dirty. Um, I'm actually just going to jump into the code to see what I'm expecting in my local development environment. Uh, there is a small change to this. So let's copy that, because we need to have the same key. And essentially, there is a, um, sorry, I'm really bad at talking and typing. <laughs> Let me finish this, and then we can talk about it. So there is a recommendation when you're adding a custom claim to namespace it with the domain of the intended recipient of the access token, or the, the system that's going to use that information. Uh, there is currently a requirement for that to be in there. I think it might actually fail if you don't because it is uh, part of the standard, but there has been feedback, and I understand, and this is totally unofficial, you're not recording this, right? Joking. Um, there, I've, I've heard that we're, we might be removing the requirement for that, um, because it doesn't make sense in all cases. Like in my case, there's no point in namespacing it, because this access token is only ever going to be consumed by one API. Um, in the case where it could be consumed by multiples, maybe it makes sense to namespace it. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're going to namespace it. We're going to say for this uh, consumer here, the, the API that's going to consume this token, we want to set the Stripe customer ID to the value of the Stripe customer ID that's in the user's uh, app metadata. So now next time they log in, even when, though we're not going to create a new Stripe customer ID, we have their Stripe customer ID already in the app metadata. We pull that out, stick it in the access token. Does that make sense? Cool. So I'm going to deploy this one. And we'll come back into flows. And we'll drag this one in. So this is where the, uh, the order becomes useful. So you can actually choose what order they get run in. There's no point in running it before we created it for the first time. Although that's just going to confuse people. Uh, so we'll put it afterwards. And we'll hit apply. And now, if I log out, and I'll log back in. I got my password right. Yay. Um, so we've now got the, um, still saying login to purchase. Refresh. So this is one of the fun things of, uh, of demos. Why did that fail? So now I'm going to show you uh, how logging works. <laughs> so under logs here, we can see there was a failed login. I did not provide, what did I not provide? I did not provide the API key. Ah, okay, so I did say that I needed to add a secret, right? So that, because at the moment, Auth0 is not authorized to talk to Stripe. Isn't logging great? Okay, so let's jump over to Stripe. And we'll go to developers. And we'll copy the key. Um, I, if, if you manage to see the whole key, that's absolutely fine by me. Um, because all you can do is you can play with my existing, like, demo account. Uh, but recommendation is not to share your public key or your private key on a live stream. So don't, don't do that, folks. Don't do this at home. Where was I going? Back into here. So we'll come back to actions into library, and we'll jump over to the custom tab. And we want to edit the create Stripe user. because That's where we want to talk to the Stripe user. Over here, we want to add a secret. And the value is this key here. And you can just about make out over here, we're going to event.secrets.stripe secret key. So I'm going to put in here Stripe secret key. And this is now not readable anymore. So if anybody comes in to make any modifications here, you can't actually get that out. Now, obviously, you could do a console log type thing and, and get it out through the logs somehow. Um, but this is a, a fairly good way of storing uh, th those kind of secrets securely so that um, they can be used by the application in the same way as you would in environment variables, as I mentioned. Uh, so I'll deploy this. Because it's already in the flow, this deployment has now gone directly to production. It's now in, uh, it'll be executed the next time I do a login. So now, hopefully, when I do a login, 
you'll probably notice that I'm redirected straight away because I was already logged into my Auth0 tenant. This is where it becomes useful if you've got multiple web applications that all use the same tenant for login. Once you've logged into one, you click log on in on the other, Auth0 already knows you're logged in, just redirect you straight back. So that's what's happened in this case, uh, but we now see that we've got the, not, the buy now button. And if we click on the buy now button, uh, behind the scenes it's gone off to Stripe, it's sent over the Stripe customer ID, so you can see my email address has already appeared at the top there, uh, because that was provided when the user was created. And if we jump over and have a look at the customers again, you can see that the Stripe customer was created as part of that login process. And if we jump inside it, uh, we've got here the customer ID, the Stripe customer ID. So this one starts with M, ends in L. If we jump over to our Auth0 users, and we look inside here, we'll see in the app metadata, we've got our Stripe customer ID starting with M, ending with L. So we've got that link there. And then also uh, the Auth0 user ID, starting with a six ending in a six, it's nice and convenient, has also been stored down here as metadata in Stripe. So the Stripe customer and the Auth0 user now have a two directional link, so from either side you can work out this order here was made by that Auth0 user and that Auth0 user has ordered these products. Um, and to the question of would orders come up in here, uh, if we go into, in fact, let me just complete this order. So please don't copy my credit card information. It's top secret. Thanks for your order. And if we go over here now, we should see a payment has come in um, for this and in there there's gonna be an order of what I just bought. So you can now manage all of your orders and your customers in one place, all of your users in another. We don't have a third party database. I'm not necessarily saying, and I, I would argue that this is probably good enough now to go straight into production. Like the likelihood of something going wrong is quite slim um, from a, a security vulnerability perspective. I'm not gonna say it's 100% secure. There's obviously a lot you'd want to do to this. But by removing a custom database, you've removed a, a big area of uh, communication, data leak um, possibilities, all of those kind of things. Um, I, would, I wouldn't put this into production. I would do a lot more testing, obviously. But as it stands, there's probably not a lot that can go wrong. I would want to put in um, exception checks and those kind of things. Like we don't have any, if something goes wrong, the application is just going to go and your user's going to be annoyed. Um, but I would argue that because you're relying on Auth0 and Stripe, vulnerability-wise, you're, you're probably okay, right? Um, but the, the main thing that I want to get across here is that uh, there are ways that you can design applications nowadays like if you tried to write a, a, a web store 10 years ago, I mean, I'd only have just built the framework of the application we're working on and we, this would be a, a, a two month course. Uh, it's a lot easier now to build really quickly by using um, services that do their jobs really well and you just focus on the business logic that makes your application um, what your customers want it to be. So you can focus on, on that business logic more than the mundane repeatable stuff that you don't necessarily need to do today. So next time you're designing an application, whether or not you require um, extensibility functions within Auth0, have a think about the, um, the underlying design that you've got in terms of what connects where and, and where you're storing information and how the, the data flows work because there might be a way that we probably haven't thought of before uh, that might make sense nowadays with the, the new platforms and tools we have. So, that was a very quick dive. We have probably about two minutes for questions. Um, one so, question. How is session management is done with OC? Uh, so, in terms of knowing whether or not a user's logged in? Or timing out or kicking out users who is not logged in? You can, conf you can configure the timeout. Um, so, what would happen here, normally within a single page web application, when you hit refresh, uh, everything resets. So in this case here, if I do a, a hard re reload, you'll see we still have a logout button. So in the background, what's happened is the SDK has gone off to Auth0, and this is where the web origin comes in that we configured, because Auth0 knows that this, is, this website's allowed to request user status. Uh, and because Auth0 does have a backend, it's got a, um, a secure HTTP only cookie on, on your, your browser, and it's able to reestablish that session and then provide tokens directly back to the web application so that your web application gets that session information back again. Uh, so Auth0 will manage a lot of that for you. Right, um, other question is, you explained the authentication. Do you have control over the authorization as well? 
Yes, but that's probably a much larger answer than we have time for. <laughs> um, yeah, so within the, the auth token, you can add scopes, you can you put in permissions. We have role-based access control. Um, we've recently launched an independent but can be used with Auth0 product for fine-grained access control, uh, which uses relationship-based access control, similar to the, the Google Zanzibar project. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of authorization stuff you can do within Auth0 as well. Cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, if you sign up for Auth0, you get a 22-day free trial of all of the, the features. Um, and after that, it reverts back to the free tier, and the free tier is free for life. There are certain limitations, obviously, within that, um, which I can go into, uh, take more than a couple of seconds, and I do want to make sure we can all get to the closing. Um, but yes, there's, there's a free tier for life, and there's uh, the opportunity for the first 22 days to try out all the features. If you already have an Auth0 account, create another tenant, and you get another 22 days on that tenant. So that's kind of cool. Um, so the configuration can all be done through, we've got a, a command line um, um, mechanism for, for configuring as well as ways of sending configuration directly in so you can store all of that because it's text based in a, um, a, a version control system for sure. Yeah. I am aware that we're on time, I think there might be one hand hovering over there, um, but come and grab me afterwards after the closing, I'm, I'm going to be back down at the booth after the closing packing up, so I'll be around for a little while, come ask me questions. But thanks for joining me, and I hope it's been useful.